Good evening, and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. In fact, a good evening to you. I trust that everyone is successfully traversing the gauntlet. That is, 2020. Things are getting scary. Times are getting hard. and People are struggling. So do me a favor. Shut out the outside world for an hour or so. Let me share some downright terrifying tales with you. Let's consider it paranormal therapy. So have a seat there on the sofa. Relax. Take a deep breath. With tonight's kickoff, we begin in the state of Michigan. And folks, let me tell you, this is a weird one. The following was submitted by Allie. Hi, my name is Allie. I live in Michigan. I wanted to call in a story. It seems kind of weird. I don't know if it goes with the show, but the more I think about it, the more paranormal it seems to me. You'll see once I explain it, but this happened about 15 years ago. I was just a kid. We moved to my house that we live in now. I have a, a room on the second story of the house with a roof that sort of like comes out right under my window. And <laughs> this story is actually the reason why I always sleep with my blinds closed at night is because one night when I was younger, I woke up in the middle of the night and looked out the window and it sounds so silly, but there was three mummies sitting outside my window on the roof. They all were gray, sort of like just super skinny, sitting sort of with their knees up and kind of looking at each other, very bony looking and you could tell they were wrapped my memories they were wrapped in something but i just remember them being mainly gray they weren't very big either it was almost like they were sort of child size i'd say i never thought about it again after i told my mom in the morning that that's what i saw because i just remember being so afraid and going back to sleep and i think i eventually got the courage to shut the blinds or something i don't remember really what happened after that but I was always told that it was a dream and not to think about it, but I guess what creeps me out about it is that I remember being awake and being able to move because I was scared and I wanted to scoot out of their sight because it was mummies by my window. Yeah, it, so it sounds silly, but I just thought I'd call it in. Personally, I'm a Christian. I believe in angels and devils, and I, I believe that sometimes the devil can and knows what will scare you and can portray itself in that way. So I don't know, maybe it was something like that, or maybe I really was dreaming. But anyways, I love the podcast. Thank you for everything you do. And I thought I'd share that story. Let me know what you think. <laughs> Thank you, Allie. You were right. That is a weird one. Mummies. Now, I think we've pretty much heard it all at this point. And assuming that these weren't a trio of mummified human corpses that somehow managed to find themselves on Allie's roof, what other possibilities may we explore to explain this odd occurrence? The obvious choice here would be sleep paralysis, but Allie mentioned that she moved in her bed to hide from the creatures. Not typical behavior for someone experiencing an episode. Now, of course, there's the standard explanation given that this was a trick played on a little girl. But it's been years. Why has no one confessed to it? Not to mention, how would a trick like that be implemented in the first place? Then there is the alien gray theory. And this one has captured a majority of my imagination. The description of the creatures isn't all that dissimilar from reports of grays in the past. The skinny body. The gray skin. But perhaps one detail yells out more than any other. The mention of the knees of the creature being pulled to its chest. I immediately thought of countless mummies found in the arid regions of Peru. Many of those mummies are also positioned with their knees to their chest. And for some of them, that's the least strange thing about them. Not only are many of these mummified bodies, of which most died some 2,000 years ago, not only are they found with red or strawberry blonde hair, something that isn't known to be found in the Americas until at least the Europeans arrived in the 15th century. But some of them 
have been found with elongated skulls that can only be described as alien. The following clip was pulled from a talk given by archaeologist Brian Forrester and comes courtesy of Idea City. Are these an unknown species? Uh, is it perhaps a hoax? Are these alien beings? Might God have been an astronaut? So I invited Brian Forster to come out here and tell us about his finds all the way from Peru. So I became fascinated a number of years ago with what's called cranial deformation because it's a practice that was done on every inhabited continent, most commonly 2,000 years ago, but in some cases much farther back. And what we found is that in general, this was only done amongst the royalty of a civilization. I was very intrigued because, of course, if there was only one of them on the planet, you could say, well, that's a freak of nature or something. But in fact, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them, in institutions and museums around the world. And what's most intriguing is that the largest ones come from one graveyard in Peru. Also, they have done DNA testing, and so far, they found the mother's DNA, which they have uh, mitochondrial, which they have not been able to fully analyze, but there's a complete absence of the father, which is odd. And this is the size of, of what this looks like. The head is the size of the torso, if not bigger. Well, the thing that stimulated me and got me motivated to get in touch with you was the reference that I came across, which says some genetic tests that have been done have found that the DNA in the skulls that were, quote, unknown in any human primate or animal known so far. That's true. Initial DNA testing has shown that there are segments of DNA from at least one Paraka skull that doesn't fit Homo sapiens or Denisovan or any known humanoid. Now this short segment barely touches on the amount of information shared in this talk. I've linked to it in the show notes for tonight's episode, so do yourself a favor and check it out. Now, Ali, I'm not suggesting that Peruvian mummies visited your childhood home, but I couldn't help but make that connection. So thank you again for making that possible. Now, I have a special alert. Somehow, tonight's episode was infiltrated by monsters. Stick around and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But for the time being, let's share a call that takes us up to the night skies. The following is Gabriel's submission from the state of Florida. Hello, Derek. My name is Gabriel. I, another one of my very creepy stories. I was about 16 years old, and I was living in Cape Coral, Florida at the time. And I was sitting in my living room, and I was watching television. At the time, we had direct TV. And if something blew into the dish on top of the house, you'd lose signal and have to research for it. And uh, my dad was clever enough to put markings on the dish. So in case the dish was ever moved, you climb up on the roof and you can move it back to its position. And you know exactly where it was marked and then the TV signal would pick back up. And I was watching television and it was during one of the commercials and my satellite signal went out. So I'm like, crap. All right, something hit the dish. So I walk outside and there's no wind. So I'm like, it was probably one of the owls because we had those little fields owls all over the place and they smack in the windows and whatnot. So I go outside and everything's dead silent. Street lights on uh, right, right at the foot of my driveway. And I walk around the side of the house and I grab the ladder and I put it up on the roof, well, on, on lean it against the house. And when I look up, it was the strangest thing ever. There was just nothing above my house. And this was middle of night and you could see all the stars. But in this one area above my house, there was nothing at all. I could look down the street and I could see the stars. I can look both directions, see the stars, but directly above my house, it was just pitch black. I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a alien uh, or a UFO. I, I have no conceivable idea what this was. And because it was pitch black, there was no way for me to tell its elevation. I didn't know how close it was to my house or whatnot. It was just like this big circular area around the top of my house looking straight up where there was just nothing. It was like that deep void kind of black. So I'm staring at this and it's dead silent outside and I'm staring at this for a good three minutes. And 
all the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I didn't hear crickets, no sounds whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, the stars started to reappear in this void, and it was almost like it dissipated, like like it maybe was like like black smoke or something. It, it, you didn't see any wisps from it. It was just like it faded away, and then everything came back into view. And when it disappeared, then you could hear all the crickets again outside. You could hear all like just like the wind blowing gently. You could you, all the sound return to the area. So at that point, I didn't even bother to take down the ladder. I just looked down and walked straight back into my house, and the TV signal was back. I don't know to this day what that was. I'm not sure I even want to know what that was. It, it baffles the the imagination. It was one of those things where I just wish somebody else would have seen it because I could not make heads or tails of what this was. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gabriel. This almost sounds like one of those black triangles that we hear about so often. But I'm also wondering if something else might be at work here. Could the dark mass that Gabriel witnessed have been a swarm or a flock of animals? Many birds and bat species flock in thick numbers. Numbers in the thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands. I've seen flocks of starlings back east that blot out the sun nearly completely. And for anyone that's ever visited Florida, given the size of the insects down there, a swarm of those things is certainly within the realm of possibility. But I struggle to believe that given the quiet atmosphere Gabriel described, he couldn't hear said birds, bugs, or bats. An obvious hole in my less than airtight theory. So with that, I simply throw my hands in the air and move on. But thank you again, Gabriel, for that great submission. Now before we make way for our next entry, I want to remind everyone that we have many Monsters Among Us items, such as t-shirts, beanies, totes, and mugs, available in the shop. Just visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and click on the Shop tab for more details. Now our next call has a real eerie feel to it. But don't take my word for it. The following is Michael's submission from Parts Unknown. Hey, Derek. This is Michael. I'm calling because I was just listening to the most recent episode and I heard Joe's call about the missed figures and the knock after he saw them. I am calling because I heard that and it really freaked me out, honestly. I grew up in the Gold Beach area. I lived there for 10 years when I was younger. And one time, something very similar happened to me. I was camping up at the Lobster Creek Campground, about 10, 15 miles up the Rogue River there in Gold Beach. And I was staying in a cabin with my girlfriend. We were the only ones up at the campground. It was completely deserted. Generator wasn't on, anything like that. So there was no power. And we're staying in, in one of the cabins. And there was the front door. We walk in the front door and there's, there's a hallway. And we were to the left side. And we were in there. We had the door closed. So our door and the front door was, were both closed. And we were just laying there, hanging out. And it was probably 2 in the morning. And we hear the front door open and then slam shut. And we just kind of stop. And we get really nervous and really freaked out. And we hear footsteps coming down the hallway towards our door. And then we hear just three loud bangs, just bang, bang, bang on our door. And we don't move. We are absolutely terrified. So we just stay awake the entire night because we don't know if there's someone out there or anything like that. We don't hear any noises afterwards, just the three loud bangs. And so we get in the morning, probably about seven o'clock in the morning. We could have stayed there until noon, but we really just wanted to get out of there while it was as soon as it got light outside so that we could see and not crash or anything like that because it's a pretty windy road to get up there. And we get up about seven o'clock in the morning and we go outside and it's a very very deep fog like can't see more than 20 feet ahead of you and i get really nervous about driving in it just because i had older car and didn't have the best anything really but we're like we can't stay here anymore it's too freaky so we get into our car and we start driving away and at the uh at the gate of the campground 
I had to get out of my car and open up the bar, drive through, get back out and close it. And as I get back into my car after closing it, I look in my rearview mirror and it looks like there's a person standing there behind the bar. But I can't make out any details because it's super foggy and everything like that. But it just terrified me, honestly. So when when Joe called in about seeing figures in the mist and then hearing three loud knocks afterwards, it really just kind of got me riled up. So that's my story. Joe, I uh, I heard you. I know what it's like. Been through that. Not the only one. Uh, thanks, Derek. Have a great night. Thank you, Michael. Now, I really enjoy it when a connection is made through stories on the show. How obscure is it that both Joe and Michael had such similar experiences? So now we have to ask ourselves, as we do each time similar stories are shared, is this a new phenomenon or experience that people are having and simply not reporting? Or is it simply a spooky coincidence? No matter the answer, I had a great time hearing Michael's tale. So thank you again for sharing it. Okay, a while back I promised some monsters, and I aim to deliver. For our first beastly encounter, we venture north to the woods of Michigan. This call was submitted anonymously. Hey, Derek. Uh, I live in Milford, Michigan, and when we first bought my house, this, so this was probably two years ago, and it was probably around fall, me and my daughter, who at the time was four, went out behind our house to this trail, and it kind of, it wasn't a huge plot of woods, but it was a good space, so we were walking around, and it was starting to get dusk, and at, at that time, I think it actually was, like, dark. We started to see, like, trees moving all around us, and, like, trees, or leaves falling off, and trees moving around, and then, I, I would say, 10 feet away, and this is really dense forest, so, like, you couldn't see especially in dark, you know, more than a couple of feet. And we heard this, the loudest, deepest snarl growl I've ever heard. Like, not like a dog. I, it was, I don't even know how to explain it. And my daughter immediately started screaming and crying. And so I told her to run back to the house. And I didn't want to turn away because I know you don't turn away from predators. So I slowly backed up, but it took off crashing. And it was, whatever it was, was extremely large. My daughter still brings it up. She had nightmares. She constantly checks to make sure the door's locked. She doesn't want to sleep alone. It terrified her. I mean, it scared me. It was, again, like a loud, deep, like you could almost feel it, like a snarl and then a growl. And I've had large dogs. I'm used to that. It was, I mean, way different than a dog. So I don't know what it was. Again, that's in Milford, Michigan, about two years ago. And I would say it was probably seven o'clock at night. I was listening to one of your other shows and it kind of reminded me of that. And she still brings it up all the time, my daughter. It kind of traumatized her. I just thought I'd give you a call and let you know. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, caller. I think I know exactly what you heard that evening. And given this town's proximity to the <clears throat> town of Ann Arbor, our caller may have heard the Wolverines quarterback of the week hyperventilating over thoughts of facing a Buckeye defense. Yeah, that was a football joke. Go Bucks. But I'm a haze from Ohio, so it's my duty to rag on that team up north. Sorry, guys. But in all seriousness, Michigan is dogman country. And you may remember the song that I shared just a few seasons back. The Legend of the Dog Man by Steve Cook. In 57, a man of the cloth found claw marks on an old church door. The newspaper said they'd been made by a dog. He'd have had to stood seven foot four. In 67, a van load of hippies told a park ranger named Quinlan they'd been awakened in the night by a scratch at the window. There was a dog man looking in and grinning. In 77, there were screams in the night near the village of Bel Air. Could have been a bobcat, could have been the wind. Nobody looked up there. 
the place of origin for this story within the song is only a few hours from Milford. So hey, maybe our caller found himself a genuine dogman. But full disclosure, the song is part of an April Fool's gag by a Michigan radio station. I know, it's a bummer. Oh, and caller, I should mention that sending your daughter ahead wasn't the best of ideas. Not only does your daughter's size make her a target for predators, both known and unknown, but running also triggers a predatory response. Pick her up and put her on your shoulders. The point is to look as big as possible. But at any rate, thanks again for the entry. Now guys, if you've exhausted your supply of TV and film, blown through the entire Netflix collection, perhaps consider pledging to our Patreon campaign to get access to Monsters Among Us Beyond. Two new shows a month plus additional bonus content, not to mention the 30 plus episodes that I have backlogged. Just hit up patreon.com, search for Monsters Among Us, or simply hit up the link in tonight's show notes. Now this evening's next entry is Erica's, and she's got a story that will jump right out at you. Hi, my name is Erica, and I'm from Texas. I've been binge listening to you, accidentally stumbled across the podcast, and it's, it's great. It helps really hear from other people who've had strange experiences that you just can't explain. I'm originally from Roswell, New Mexico, and so I'm not a stranger to uh, strange things. My children and I and my husband, on the summers, we try to go to New Mexico and do some camping. And this time, we had chosen to go to Angel Fire, which is a place I had only been there maybe once as a child. We had a great time, and we had rented a house, and nothing crazy, a lot of fishing, and a lot of fun. One of the things about Angel Fire are the night skies. They're absolutely beautiful. It's the mountains. They just open up, and you can see so many stars. On our last night, my children, my nephew was also with us, had asked if we could just go on a, an adventure to go stargazing. So we drove down this road, uh, one of the main highways, and as we're driving past this lake, we see this very secluded playground, and the kids ask, hey, can we, can we go ahead and swing under the stars? So we pull up, and it's a pebble road, and the kids dart out of the car, and go running straight for the swing set. My nephew says that he needs to go use the restroom. There's an outdoor restroom facility on the playground and it's really dark. There's one light that lights up half of the playground but the other half where the restroom is located is really, really dark. So my nephew goes to the door and he pulls on it and it's locked. He yells at me and he says, it's locked. As soon as he yells, um, and it was a loud echoing yell, uh, we're in the mountains, and so it was a really strong noise uh, from his voice. And we start to hear kind of somebody throwing something at us. And as I mentioned, the road was made of pebbles, so it was clear that whatever was being thrown in our direction was small, like a pebble, very small. My nephew, he yells at my daughter and says, stop throwing rocks this way. She says, I'm not throwing them. And so she's running for the swing set, which is further out away from the light. My nephew starts to use the restroom facing the direction of the restroom. And we hear this loud thump. It sounded like something had fallen on a metal roof. So I look at the restroom facility and the roof is metal. So obviously either a tree limb or something had fallen on top of it is what I had assumed. But seconds later, you hear something fall to the ground and these pebbles, kind of like the, the noise that your feet make when they hit the pebbles. At that time, my daughter, as I mentioned, was running towards the furthest swing set, which happened to be right in the direction of where we're hearing these noises. And as I look at her and I'm trying to process everything, my husband's in the car pulling his, you know, our baby out. So he, he hears the thump as well. And I see his head poke out out of the car. We're all just kind of looking for it. But my daughter's reaction was so strange. She had her finger out and she had her arm pulled out. She was pointing towards something. 
and she couldn't say anything, but she was trying. No words were coming out. She was just like, uh, 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 uh. As she's doing that, she's moving her finger in the direction of something. And we can hear footsteps now on the ground. Like it sounds like something is now running on the ground and it's heading towards the tree line. And I, it's crazy talking about it. It looked like a kangaroo. (laughs) And I know this sounds crazy. It, It looked like a kangaroo. Um, it had the tail of a kangaroo, but it wasn't, it, it was scaly and I couldn't make out the color because it was a couple feet away in this dark, darker area. My daughter was so scared. She couldn't, as I mentioned, she couldn't speak. So I run over to her and I shake her and I say, run to the car and I start screaming And everybody, my nephew, everyone starts running to the car. My husband is starts the car, um, and I'm the furthest one out at this time. Uh, I will never forget what this thing looked like, though. It was running on all twos at first, and then it went to fours. It went to four. It started running faster. It, as I mentioned, had a long tail. And it had, it looked scaly, didn't look like it had fur, didn't look like it had any hair, didn't have the features of a kangaroo from the face. In fact, it just had these big eyes and I couldn't see anything else from it. There was a glare in the eyes is all that I could pick up. It didn't look like it came from this planet. (laughs) It looked like anything, nothing I'd ever seen. It ran into the trees, and we lost sight of it. We packed up the kids quicker than quick, and we drove off. The night sky had given that area a lot of, um, it was glowing, and so the stars were so bright. It was absolutely the most terrifying moment I've ever had in my life. And my kids... They don't talk about it often, but once in a while, when we mention it, um, in fact, for the last two years, we haven't even gone to New Mexico uh, for our annual camping trip just because this really shook them up. It's something that I've always wanted to know if anyone has ever seen anything like this. I, I, I'm from New Mexico, so I know about Dulce Canyon. I know about experiments. I know about all that stuff that that happens. Um, and I know, obviously, about the aliens since I'm from Roswell. But I don't know what this was. And I've never, and I've researched it, and I can't find any information on a kangaroo-like <laughs> creature. Uh, thank you so much for your podcast. I appreciate for having an outlet to talk about things that you normally would never mention. It's definitely a comfortable platform. So thank you. Thank you, Erica. When I think of a scaly, kangaroo-shaped creature, I immediately picture a dinosaur. If you remember back to Season 9, Episode 12, Jackie also told of a similar creature that she saw in Michigan. Her sighting resulted in mutilated livestock. Now outside of a surviving dinosaur species, the possibility of which is near zero, I'm struggling to come up with a logical suspect. I first thought of a bird like an ostrich or an emu, but at least Erica's creature was reported to run on all fours. Birds do not have more than two legs, and last I checked they also don't eat sheep. The only other logical thing I can think of is a bear with a skin disorder like mange that would result in severe hair loss and scabbing and scarring all over the body. And let me tell you how off-putting a hairless bear can be. Oddly enough, many appear blue or gray in color, and due to the creature's disorder, the skin would appear scaly. On top of that, injured or sick animals like that often prey on weak or domesticated animals, so that could explain why it mysteriously attacked the sheep. Now I've linked to a few photos that show exactly what I'm talking about in the show notes, so hop on over and take a look. Of course a black bear 
which lives in both Michigan and New Mexico, can run on its hind legs for a varied period of time, which also helps to explain how Erica's creature began bipedally and then dropped down to all fours. This is merely a theory, however, a theory I came up with while editing the call. So maybe I'm way off. But off or not, like Erica said, if anyone out there has seen anything like this strange, scaly, kangaroo-type creature, give the hotline a call at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. And as always, I'm accepting true paranormal stories of all kinds. Thank you again, Erica, for sharing your tale. Now before we release the remaining beast, so to speak, I have one more UFO call I'd like to submit for your examination. So with that, I present to you a submission by BH in the state of Colorado. Hi, I'm going to go by BH. I'm calling about a UFO experience that I had in the uh, time frame of 1990 in Boulder, Colorado. My best friend and roommate had just graduated, and my other best friend, uh, the three of us, we were going to have some dinner, have some beers, kind of celebrate because uh, my best friend, I'm going to call him Anthony, he was going to move the next day to go to graduate school out of state. So we were going to celebrate uh, kind of our last time together in, in school at the University of Colorado. We went out, we had a good time. It was a beautiful summer evening. You know, Colorado summers can be absolutely just stunning and beautiful and the evenings can be fantastic. And we went out to a few areas on, on Pearl Street and up on the hill and Anthony and I, we lived uh, at the north side of the uh, University of Colorado campus, not directly adjacent to it, but just north, about a quarter of a mile uh, of the campus. After we'd finished, you know, going out, have, having some beers and, and some dinner, we were walking back to our apartment and we were walking through campus and there was a section of campus that at the time was under construction. There was a massive construction project to expand the recreation center to the size that it is now. It was it was much smaller at the time that I went to school there, but it was uh, it's it, it's a huge facility now. As we got to that part of the campus, where the recreation center sits and where this construction project sits, it's on the northeast corner of the campus in Boulder, uh, right next to the football stadium. And they had just begun excavation. And as part of the uh, excavation process, they lay down these weird mats that cut down erosion. And we were walking through this construction area the campus is kind of up on a slight hill mesa above the rest of town. And it's a beautiful night, full, just clear skies. And we were just shooting the breeze. Um, and we were sitting down in this construction area on these mats, looking up at the sky and just, you know, philosophizing about life and laughing and giving, giving each other lots of crap. And, uh, you know, it, I've always been a stargazer and... Um, I was like looking for satellites and it was a beautiful night to look for satellites. And most of the satellites that you see are traveling from a, a north to south uh, pattern and it makes it really easy. Satellites that actually hold the trajectory or, or the rotation of the earth, you, you can't see it, it just looks like a star. But so we were looking for satellites and they look just like a star that's cruising along. And we're talking and, you know, we saw a couple of satellites here and there. And then all of a sudden there was this weird coming from the north. We were laying on the mat facing the north. And all of a sudden these three oval shapes and, and they were completely dark. There were no flashing lights, none of that crap that you hear about with UFOs where you know, so, oh my God, I saw flashing lights and, you know, they were flashing around like a, a spinning Frisbee and any of that stuff. These were um, just pure black shadows. 
egg shapes flying in a triangle pattern from north to south, and they were just cruising, um, just real, real steady, real quiet. They're flying from north to south. They weren't going incredibly fast, and that the uh, altitude that they were flying at was probably, I don't know, maybe around 3,000 feet. University of Colorado is at a little over a mile high. And when these craft flew from north to south, they were blocking out the stars. So we knew that they were below at a much lower uh, altitude than the stars. They weren't out in space. It was something I'd never seen before. I'd seen tons of satellites as a kid. And there's a few things that are interesting about this. You know, if, if people look back a little bit in the history here, I'm dating myself, but the stealth fighter was actually not revealed fully publicly until during Desert Storm. And the pattern dimension shape of an F-117 stealth is more of a triangle. These were a perfect oval. So they weren't anything like a stealth fighter. And if, you know, they may have been some other military craft, but the other thing that was incredibly fascinating and, and actually scared the hell out of me was uh, they were silent, completely silent. And I could tell how low they were that if they were any other craft, they would have made some noise. And to this day, my two other best friends were still in contact. We still talk about that. And we, we actually did an exercise to see, you know, okay, you write down what you saw, you write down what you saw, I'll write down what I saw. And just, you know, so we didn't influence each other. And we all wrote the same descriptions. So, you know, this was pre-stealth, uh, pre-web. It wasn't pre-internet. It was pre-web. Uh, didn't see a lot of the YouTube stuff. That was way before that. And I still think about it a lot to this day because it makes me wonder what, you know, just it expanded and, and just blew away any assumptions that I have about anything that goes on in this world. Pretty incredible. So anyway, that's my story. Thanks. I uh, love the podcast. Love to support it. Uh, keep up the great work and love hearing the stories and your, your skepticism and devil's advocate approach on uh, reviewing the, the stories. Thanks. Thank you, BH. Given the description BH gave, it's hard for me not to picture the infamous tic-tac-toe UFO from the recently released jet surveillance video from the U.S. military. If you recall, the craft received its name based on its resemblance of the candy breath mint Tic Tacs. Pretty much the exact shape described by BH. So is it possible that there are more of these things, intelligently controlled by something or someone? Or, like Gabriel's call from earlier this evening, are we left guessing about what's overhead? Either way, thanks again, BH, for taking the time to share. Now, for the rest of those monsters I keep teasing you with. This next story is Chloe's from the Lone Star State of Texas. Hi Derek, it's Chloe from Texas. I'm calling in another one of my brother's experiences. He's given me permission to call in a few of his experiences. He's had quite a few and unlike me, he really doesn't have a lot of interest in the paranormal. He kind of tries to stray from it. It seems like the more that he does that, the more experiences he has. But um, I digress. He's given me permission to call this one in. This one was from when we were kids. I wasn't with him during this experience. He was actually staying the night at one of his friend's homes. I believe they lived in like a mobile home, like a trailer house. And he was there with several other boys. I think they were about 12 or 13 right in there. They were, I think, middle school. And, you know, they were staying up, drinking Mountain Dew, playing video games, doing that kind of thing. And uh, one of them happened to glance out the window and just saw something zoom by. He started trying to get the other boy's attention. And they were, he was like, what is, what was that? Did you guys see that? And they were like, no, no. But they all kind of went up to the window to look. And after a while, it zoomed by again. And, of course, this time they all just saw the blur and they all started freaking out. They all said, oh, my God, what was that? You know, just totally losing it. And so... They're kind of looking for this thing, and they can't quite figure out what it is. They're thinking, maybe, is it a deer? Is it a really fast dog? Is it a coyote? They can't They can't figure out what it is. And it just starts circling the trailer super, super, super fast. And they said not only could they like see it zooming by, but they could hear it just 
whirring around the trailer super, super fast. And they said at a certain point they could almost feel it. And they're all screaming and freaking out. And, you know, the kids' parents come in and like, what what's going on? And, you know, they only caught the tail end of whatever was happening. And they were like, what was that? And the kids, I don't know, something was outside. What was this? Is there a person out there? The parents, we didn't see anything, of course, <laughs> right? Like in true Spielberg fashion, the parents saw nothing. So they tried to go back to sleep after that point, just super spooked. And so they figured, okay, let's just call it a night. You know, I think it was about midnight, one in the morning, something like that. Let's just call it a night. So they all lay down and turn the lights on, try to go to sleep. And they could hear it out there just making circles and circles again, not as fast this time, but they can hear it just running around the trailer, whatever this thing is. And like I said, no, none of them got a real good look at it. It's not like they had super great floodlights and it was, it was a dark night. Out, out here in the country, we don't have a lot of light pollution, so you can't see 10 feet from your window. They never figured out what it was, but they could hear it all night just circling the trailer. I don't know whether or not they went to go investigate to see if there were tracks the next morning, but I think the boys pretty much just kind of got in their rides and skedaddled home after that. I remember my brother coming home and telling me about it immediately, and it stuck with me for a while. I'd actually forgotten about it when we were talking about spooky experiences a few nights ago. He and I just kind of sharing some things that have happened to us and he brought that up and I was like oh my god I've got to call that in I totally forgot that that happened to you so that's just one of the weird things that's happened to us love the show love what you're doing and I can't wait for the Anza Borrego documentary so good luck keep doing what you're doing bye thank you Chloe I've been doing the show so long that I'm afraid my stories are starting to be repetitive but Chloe's brother's experience sounds very similar to an encounter my parents and grandparents experienced in my grandfather's trailer park home back in the early 90s. According to my dad, at 3 a.m., something or someone was running on the roof of the trailer and or slapping the sides. Whatever it was, dad said it was big and very fast. Unfortunately, being around 10 years old, I slept through the entire thing. So no answers today, Chloe, but a huge thank you for sharing this experience. Now before we gut and flay these last two whoppers, let me remind you that you can get additional info on the show, updates, and share stories with fellow listeners on our social media platforms. You can find us at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and now Reddit. So search Monsters Among Us today and let Addie, Warren, Tony, John, Sarah, and Josh fill in the void between new episodes. Now this certainly wouldn't be a well-rounded episode if there was not a visit from the big guy. So to remedy that situation, I turn it over to James in the state of North Dakota. Hello, my name is James. I uh, used to work up in the oil fields of North Dakota. It's approximately 2012, January. I'd been working there about three days, never experienced the north. It's pretty, pretty intense to begin with. So I had to drive back to the shop, which is about three hours from our drilling location. And it's middle of the night, probably three in the morning, two in the morning, somewhere in that range. And I'm on this stretch of highway between Kildare and Williston. And I see off in the distance, maybe about a quarter mile away, something catches my eye. It, you know, shiny, looks like eyes off in the distance. As I'm coming up, it stops, pokes his head up and looks at me. I mean, the lies were just bright green. I mean, it was incredible how, how reflective they were. I thought maybe it had been an owl because, you know, I'm from Florida, I'd seen plenty of owls. But what caught me is as soon as I was going past it, it took off running. The way it ran was very interesting, like a monkey. Plain and simple. I mean, it, it had its ass low. It looked like a gorilla running, you know, like you would see in National Geographic. The whole ass was wiggling as it was running. It was using its hands to help push it through the snow. I probably stood about four foot tall, and it was white as could be. Didn't really get a good look at it. I didn't stop. I didn't want to mess around with it. I just kept going. And when I got back to the rig, I told my friend about it, and he immediately said, That's a Bigfoot. That's a Bigfoot, Jim's. Uh, I don't know if it was or not. I am a believer in cryptids, but anyway, that's my story. Thanks. Thank you, sir. 
We've actually heard of a few North Dakota Bigfoot sightings over the years, but the mention of a white creature threw me off a bit. We've also heard of white, Bigfoot-like creatures on past episodes as well, but most of those reports came from areas like Ohio, Pennsylvania, even New England. Many, many miles from the windswept plains of North Dakota. But I'll tell you this much. Having white fur would certainly be an advantage to anything living that far north. At least in the winter months. So thanks again, James, for keeping your eyes open. We really appreciate you helping us fill our Sasquatch quota. And just like that, we've reached our final destination for the evening. The heartland of America. The Midwest. Indiana. It is in the Hoosier State that we find our next and last submitter. So here is Sam with a story I think you're all going to enjoy. Hi, Derek. This is Sam from Indiana. I've told you before, I, I love listening to your podcast. On third shift, it keeps me awake, but I was not prepared for what I heard today on one of your earlier seasons. Season one, I'm listening through from the beginning. And... I, Okay, so I, you were asking back in season one about encounters with, with the mirrored men, which when I first heard the first story about it, it sent chills through my spine because I, I think I might have encountered them before. So I, I was going into work one morning, well, evening, you know, depending on how you look at it, but it was about um, 11 p.m. This was last year. It was warm outside, so it was sometime either late spring through early fall. And I remember I had gone out to my car and looked down my street, and I've got a very poorly lit street, but it's not a busy street at all. And my back porch light is actually the, the brightest light on the street, and it, it kind of shines out quite a ways. But there's a major road, uh, a highway that runs down at the end of my street, and that one is well lit. And when I was going out to my car, I'm, I'm always kind of creeped out because there's a, a blind wall where there's a blind corner, I should say, where there's a wall of my house that when I go past it to go to my car, I, I can't see until I'm right there. So I'm always, you know, jumpy and worried there's going to be something on, on the other side. Well, I went out and of course there wasn't. But when I went and looked down the street, there were not three men, but there were two men walking side by side. And it was eerie. The, the way they were walking, the best way I know to describe it, it was almost like not quite dancing, but they were kind of walking to the left and to the right. And when one would move to the left and to the right, the other would do the exact same and really creep me out. There's a liquor store down the road from where I live. So I, I was thinking that maybe, you know, it, it's two guys that got drunk, you know, just maybe walking home or there's several bars around. I thought maybe they're walking home and just, you know, maybe doing some kind of weird walk. And that might still be the case, but I heard that story and it just gave me chills because at the time it, it just gave me a weird eerie feeling i didn't lose any time there was no other indication um of, of anything out of the ordinary other than these two men walking side by side in this this weird way that i mean mirrored men is the best way to describe it and i really appreciate you having those stories on there because i'm going to be on the lookout from now on if, if that was something that you know other people are witnessing that's just a pretty terrifying thing to hear so um, i really appreciate your podcast and I will definitely be more wary of groups of men walking in a, in a mirrored fashion from here on out. Thanks, Derek. I appreciate the entry and the vigilance, Sam. I know what everyone is thinking. This can't be the mirrored man. There were only two of them. Well, let me remind you that with this phenomenon, it's almost as if the rules are being written with each story that's submitted. But in this case, we've heard this detail before. Back in season four or five, I can't even remember now, I shared a YouTube video by the page Beyond Creepy in which he described a motorcycle cop's encounter with two strange men in the Australian outback. Here is a segment of that story to refresh your memory. Waiting until the dust settled, Terence was finally able to get a good look at the two people inside the car. He ordered them out of the vehicle. As they stepped out, he could see them clearly. Their faces were expressionless. They stood easily seven feet tall. The strangest thing? They looked exactly alike. 
They were also both wearing sunglasses, although these were unlike anything Terence had ever seen before. Terence became increasingly more frightened as the situation progressed, though his training allowed him to maintain a straight face. As they stared at each other, the two men suddenly sidestepped away from the Chevy so that they were now fully exposed. The weird thing to Terence was that when they stepped away from the vehicle, it was completely in sync, like he was watching a mirror image of the same person. Both men wore torn, mud-stained jeans held up by leather belts, and disheveled shirts neither tucked in nor out. Terence wondered if they were playing with him. Just then, the two men began to walk towards him, their arms at their sides. Terence ordered them to halt, but they didn't. They continued to advance in his direction. Feeling his life was in danger, Terence ordered them to stop and raise their hands. As the two lanky figures get closer, moving in sync, Terence can see even clearer now how they appear to be mirror images of each other. They seem unfazed by the gun. Eventually, the two men stepped away from each other, moving away at angles as if to get around the officer. The spindly giants calmly walk down the slope and disappear behind the dirt horizon. Seeing them gone, I am able to breathe again. In the midst of the excitement, I had forgotten about the Chevy. Turning around, Terence was shocked to see that the Chevy was gone. It hadn't driven away on its own, nor was it buried in the sand. It was just gone. From there, things went off the rails. Terence remembered feeling an intense desire to vomit. He closed his eyes. When he opened them, it was now dark out. When he knelt down, it was still the afternoon. However, when he opened his eyes, seconds later, it was now nighttime. He was still in the kneeling position. God, how long have I been kneeling like this, he wondered. He eventually returned to his motorcycle and left the area. There are some very strange details in this story that weren't included in that clip. So if you haven't already, hit up those show notes and give this video a watch. Now I certainly cannot say that what Sam encountered was the mirrored men. After all, one of the main traits of the mirrored men encounter, missing time, was not experienced here. At least, not that Sam can remember. So if this was yet another brush with these terrifying entities, the details provided only help to expand the mystery further, rather than answer any of our long-lasting questions. But in regards to these infamous entities, I'm not all that surprised that they've managed to stay in the shadows. So thank you again, Sam, for connecting those dots. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support was provided by Addie Lloyd and Sarah Carter Hayes. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And that teeth-chattering score that you hear under each of these calls. Let's code.ag music. So thank you all for listening, and until next week. Tonight's secret submission is even new to me, so please welcome London from the state of South Carolina to the program. Hey, I'm London and I'd like to tell my story. We uh, had this thing that we're going to call a witch mongoose. Sounds like a goofy name, but uh, I'm from South Carolina and uh, we live in a very small town. And uh, thank you, Derek, for everything you do. We love your podcast. Now I'll get on with the story. So I live in this house, and it was just me and my family and stuff like that. We've never had problems before, never, with anything. Like, I probably didn't even know what the term cryptid meant. My parents kind of shielded me from, you know, ghosts and stuff like that. So I never really was really into that. So we were here, like, you know, if you just walked outside or 
you know, my parents were smokers. They got time to smoke, and they hear like this distinct laugh, like a a cackling almost, like a deep like monkey cackling. It was it was weird. And it's South Carolina. We don't have monkeys, so I don't think we really, we really have anything that would laugh like that either, like a cackling. So my parents would ignore it, but they would tell me that every time they heard that cackle, that something bad would always happen. And, and that day or the next. And I never believed it. You know, my brother, sister, we never heard such things, so we didn't really believe it. And then I was outside one time after my parents had gotten into this, this big argument. And I was outside, and I heard the cackle. And I was out there by myself, just stepping outside for a moment. And I was like, what in the world? It kind of freaked me out a little bit, nothing to lie. But I just stayed there because I was kind of paralyzed in fear. And I just stood and I looked, and I was like, I have no idea. Is, is this the cackle my parents were talking about? Is what I was thinking to myself. And then that same day, my parents had filed a divorce. And I was like, oh my gosh, dude. I mean, I mean, I was a child. I was thinking it couldn't get worse than this. And then what happened was a couple months later, I didn't really think about it. Again. It was honestly out of my head. Wasn't really choked up about it or anything. And then me and my sister had went outside because she was babysitting me at the time after the divorce. We were outside and we heard this same cackle. We both kind of looked at each other in a moment of realization like, oh, geez, we know what this is. And my, me and my sister, we were like, oh, my. So we just, we just hard butt inside and then you know craziest thing that same day me and my sister had gotten into a really bad argument uh she had pushed me down the stairs and not it didn't really hurt me but it, she had pushed me down the stairs you know this child abuse and i was like this is, this is getting crazy and my mom would talk about her experience and when she heard the laughing and you know she was outside smoking she ignored it she's not really one to be scared of the paranormal or, you know, supernatural or cryptid or whatever. She just walked back inside, burnt out a cigarette. Uh, I do remember this, though. That same night, my older brother and my mom had gotten in a bad argument. Uh, her phone was thrown against the mirror and cracked. So, you know. Uh, that's my story about the witch mongoose. Uh, thank you, Derek. Tell me if you know anything about what this could possibly be. It's, it's over now. It's not really something I'm worried about anymore. But, uh... Thank you, and hope to see my call on the next episode. Bye. Thank you, London. I certainly don't know much, or anything, about a witch mongoose. But I do know of another mongoose that's quite possibly the most well-known mongoose of them all. Jeff, the talking mongoose. This is indeed a very strange and a real creepy true story. It all began in the legendary location, the Isle of Man. In the early 20th century, this bizarre story got loads of press in the British tabloids. September of 1931, the Irving family was sitting down enjoying a nice home-cooked meal when all of a sudden they started to hear scratches on the wall. They didn't think much of it at the time and figured it must be a rat or some sort of small animal trapped within the walls. Over time, the scratching would become more and more frequent. Then one day, the family heard a voice coming from within the walls. This voice introduced itself to the family as Jeff. It told the Irvings that it was a very clever talking mongoose and that it was born in 1852 in New Delhi, India. According to the family, Jeff was the size of a small rat with yellowish fur and a very large bushy tail. Jeff told the family that it was an earthbound spirit, a ghost in the form of a mongoose. It also said that it was a freak of nature. Jeff and the Irvings became very close. Jeff would guard the house when they were out and inform them if anyone was approaching. Jeff would also keep a close eye on the fire as the Irvings would constantly forget to put it out. Jeff would also make sure none of the family members overslept. Jeff would assume the role of a house cat and help the family with their rodent problems, although Jeff would rather scare them than kill them. Over time, Jeff was considered to be another member of the family. Now this story of Jeff spread like wildfire among the local residents. Eventually, every newspaper in Britain wrote a story about Jeff. People were amazed by the story, and they all flocked to the Isle of Man in hopes that they could get a glimpse of Jeff the Talking Mongoose. That clip comes courtesy of The Sun. Thank you again, London, for taking the time to share your call. And thank you for sticking around to the end of the program. Have a great night.